Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know me and weren't here at the very beginning of this afternoon, I'm Sandy Knapp. I'm a botanist from the Natural History Museum. I'm actually a tropical botanist, but I'm a BSBI trustee, and it's a great honor to be a trustee of the BSBI. And I've um, I've really learned a lot about British botany since being a member of the BSBI, which has been really, really great for me. Um, so I'm kind of one of those marginalized groups being a tropical botanist. But, but what we're gonna talk about now is we're going to have a panel discussion um, to get some really different views. We have a lot of different kinds of people in the BSBI. And we're going to have a panel discussion now, which brings together four people from really different, different perspectives to talk about how we as a learned society, as the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, can actually build a diverse community of botanists who communicate with each other, share information, and really help each other to appreciate nature, but also help disseminate that message about how nature, how important nature is to the rest of life, uh, the, to actually our very, own, our very own survival. So we have four speakers and I'll ha let them speak, each of them for about five minutes. Um, I'll tell you a bit about them now and then they'll introduce themselves with their names and talk for about five minutes. And then I have some questions that I'd like to put to them, but I'd like you as the audience to also put questions that you'd like me to ask to the panelists into um, into the ch into the Q and A box. So please do that. I'll keep my eye on that, and then and then um, we can we can um, carry on that conversation and, and open up the discussion a bit more than just between the four four panelists here, because I'm sure that what they're going to say is going to be fascinating, and that will bring up lots of questions that you from the audience will have as well. So we have with us this afternoon Mark Hutchinson, who's the vice chair of the Sheffield Environmental Movement who's gonna discuss barriers to including marginalized groups in environmental activities. We have Falguni Sarkar, who's a BSBI member with experience in bringing botany to the visually impaired. Some of you may have heard her talk um, in a previous AEM. We have Maria Long, who was BSBI's Ireland officer from 2009, 2012 to 2019, who now works with the National Parks and Wildlife Service in Ireland. And she's gonna to talk to us about outreach work with farmers. And, um, and Billy Fullwood, who is an 18 year old member of the BSBI and actually the person who I'm hoping is gonna replace me one day. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark first and then Falguni and then Maria and then Billy. So if you could just say your name so people can connect the name, although it's labeled below you, but you know, whatever. Just say your name and then, and then do your five minutes and then we'll get on to talking together. Thanks. Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Sandy. I've been absolutely fascinated by this morning. I've enjoyed it so much. Um, can I thank the BSBI for allowing myself as a representative of the Sheffield Environmental Movement to come and speak to your organization? Um, it's been tremendous listening to the various talks and the enthusiasm with which the organization is trying to embrace so many aspects of your work to those around you, to the communities around you. And I feel that this could be a, a, a big step forward in terms of how the barriers can be broken down. Perhaps I should say just a few minutes about the Sheffield Environmental Movement. We are a charitable organization that was set up in Sheffield a few years ago and it came about through a group of two or three friends who had started a walking group 17 or 18 years ago. We live in the city of Sheffield, but we were very keen to make the link between where we lived in the urban environment to the more natural world and the countryside and the environment around us. And we chose to walk as a means of doing that because walking was something that we could do. Walking was something that could bring us together. Walking was something that allowed us to share and talk as a group of people who had an interest, an interest in the countryside. I feel that botany also allows people to come together, as I've heard this morning, who have a shared interest and to find out more and to develop their skills and abilities. But what were some of the barriers that we found that perhaps allowed us to hopefully overcome some of the issues that can often face people of colour. We are a group from an African diasporic background. So a mix of people of different ages, 
who, for whom Africa is a central form of heritage, whether we are people who have gone on to live in the Caribbean and then come to Britain, or those who are of dual or multiple heritage, but for whom Africa is a central place of, of um, historical resonance. But we live here in Sheffield, we live here in Britain, and we found that there were perhaps a number of barriers as we went into the countryside and wanted to explore and fully appreciate the world around us. One of the barriers that we found was the issue of cost. Another barrier was about time and maybe just that feeling of belonging and being part of the world around us. And we found, I think, that the issue of cost, because it can often be sometimes seemingly expensive to do activities in the countryside. So we would walk from where we were. We had a, a point in Sheffield from which we would walk and go out and enjoy the countryside. We found that um, time could be an issue. Often people in an urbanised environment, and it's not always the case that all black people live in the, in the cities and towns, but many of them do for historical reasons, and um, are often a slightly younger profile in terms of population, are juggling a work-life balance. How do we provide opportunities for people to find time and space to meet? So we would meet at the same time every month at the same place. And I love the idea this morning of the wildflower arrangements every Sunday evening at the same time. It gives people a focal point to know when and where an activity will take place. But also the issue perhaps underlining that was the notion of belonging and feeling that we could be part of the world around us and have a say in the world around us because often our presence had been denied, going way back even to the history of, of this nation, of this country. And I feel that there are ways in which BSBI can reach out and make those links with the wider communities around them. And those marginalised communities, particularly maybe the black communities, can feel very much part of British society because we are part of British society. And I love the way in which, in looking at the flowers and plants today and talking about the way that they tell us so much about the world around us, that these plants and flowers can be found anywhere. We can find them on a council estate. We can find them in the leafy suburbs. People can notice them and find them all around us. And as a group, there are people who spot them and see these things and want to comment on them within our communities. And the ability then to bring the BSBI towards those communities, those communities towards those people, I feel can be a really exciting one. So the BSBI, and I love the way that you've been open to say, we are here, we want to work with and be part of the bigger picture that's going on in society. And that these communities are our communities as well. And whether it's through the use of champions, whether it's through the groups of heritage organisations, community groups, there are lots of people out there who, who, particularly maybe during the pandemic, have been out walking, have looked in their local area, who've noticed some of the natural fauna and flowers around them, who may be thinking, um, I don't know the name of that. What is the name of that? And I love the way that this morning, Maura, through her beautiful photographs and text, just gave an opportunity to allow people maybe to take the stress out of, oh, I don't know the scientific name or how to pronounce it. Giving people access, giving people the ability to see that the SBI have ways in which these uh, issues can be overcome. I love the notion of a competition because that can often be a way of drawing people in. Perhaps people to go out and take a photograph from what they see outside of their window or when they go for a walk and to share some of their thoughts and views about the flowers and plants that they see. And as a group, we have worked within Sheffield, whether um, working with other groups um, within our city and our town, refugees, um, working with um, Asian women, working across different societies and groups to try and work with 
and understand better the environment around us. At the moment, our director, Max Oleyamba, is on a residential with a group of um, Asian mothers and children. There are ways in which we then try to reach out and work with experts such as BSBI who may come and share their knowledge with communities who want to find out more. And often it's the case that people not only have an interest in the natural environment, but they themselves have skills and abilities. Some of those may have been from a previous life. Um, I remember growing up with my mother who had a great interest in flowers and plants from her time as being a, a child in Jamaica in the rural community. She had that deep knowledge and understanding. And there's often parallels that can be drawn when we look at how plants and, and um, flowers develop in one part of the world. Maybe we learn um, from what people know from other parts of society. Right. And I feel, you. feel that that's really what I wanted to say today. Fantastic. And we'll have, a, we'll have an opportunity to explore some of those things because you've already given me some ideas about things to, for us to talk about together. Fal, can I, can I um, pass the microphone to you for just five minutes just to tell us a bit about you and what you're doing? Good afternoon to you all. My name is Falguni and I'm a naturalist belonging to the Darlington and Teesdale Naturalist Field Club. I would like to thank the BSPI for inviting me to join in this panel discussion. This is my third talk about botany and the visually impaired. In 2019, I presented a poster and in 2020, a talk. Botany is for everyone. So there is no reason why the visually impaired could not identify plants, trees, flowers for scientific study, as well as get pleasure and fulfillment from this. Some due to primary sight loss at birth have never seen the flora that we know and love. Others may feel they have lost the ability to enjoy it after suffering from acquired visual impairment later in life. So how can we and the BSPI could help them? First, training is required to show how to assist the visual impaired for guided walks with one-to-one -one support. I have been involved with the project since 2018 we also involve other organizations. For example, the Brightwater Project is planning to provide independent access to the South Park in Darlington with touch sensitive way markers and audio guides. Here, most people are in wheelchairs. Some walks with specially designed sticks, guide dogs, and special armbands attached to the guide's arm. Groundwork, a local community project helped to plant 298 plants in the Educational Biodiversity Sensory Garden. Plants were selected for their feel, touch, smell, sensory, and sound qualities. Ideally, they would feel and smell different with different touch characteristics. When we touch the bark or the leaf of a tree, the senses have the power to imprint the acquired knowledge to our memory. So by repeating the activity, this helps visually impaired people to identify trees, plants on their own. Learning together should be more frequent. That helps to recognize and recall this memory again. There are many technologies available that can help. Alexa is a good tool and that could connect to the BSBI at home. We used this successfully during the lockdown. The BSPI could create a library of audible resources. Microchips can be embedded in the tree. And when a detecting device is nearby, that activates the information and you could hear the description of the tree. Other ideas that technology can provide include hand camera for sign reading, thermal sensing, wearable computers, magnetic field sensing, image, the range of tactile senses. The RNIB estimated that there are 26,000 blind and partially sighted Braille users in the UK and 869 children learning Braille in English schools. 
BSBI could develop simple botany books in Braille. I would like to see BSBI challenge itself and ask, what are you doing for the visually impaired? The BSBI could work with RNIB to create an online accessible training module to ensure we know how to help visually impaired to learn botany. They could also have suitable outdoor botanical events as well as indoor events, specifically chosen for their accessibility without steep paths and uneven ground, with provision for hearing loops, wheelchair use, and guide dogs. I look forward to the day when I could experience a visually impaired person speaking to the BSBI conference. This ongoing work has started at a very local level, but this can be implemented anywhere in the world. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Fal, that was, that was great. Okay, I'm gonna pass to, um, to Maria now, who will talk to us about, about her work, and then to Billy, and then, and then I have, I've got so, much, so many questions. This is gonna take us way more than an hour, guys. <laughs> Maria, over to you. Great stuff. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you very much for, uh, to, to everybody for, for inviting me to be here. My name is Maria Long and I currently work as the grassland ecologist for the National Parks and Wildlife Service and that's the Nature Conservation Agency uh, in the Irish government. And previously, as, as Sandy mentioned, I worked as the Ireland officer for the BSBI for seven years. I've been an ecologist for over 20 years and I've worked in consultancy, been self-employed and worked in academia. And throughout all of that, uh, a really common thread, something I found hugely important for me and for our whole area has been communication and outreach. I've always had a drive to share a wonder in nature and I've always strived to try to inspire people to, to notice and to care for nature. And I really believe that an open approach infused with passion and look, we're, we're a self-selected group here. We are all passionate about nature in, in some way. Uh, sharing that in an open way is so important and can take you so far in terms of reaching a, a diverse group of people. But we need to be, I think, always very mindful different people will find different elements of interest and different things will, will grab different people. Some people are very interested in the health benefits of plants. Can I make something from this? Can I make a tonic? Can it be used as a remedy? Can I eat this? Uh, this will interest some people. The names of plants, the culture, the folklore, uh, quirky local names, the meanings of the scientific names, this will fascinate some people and, and engage them. Uh, because I'm from Ireland, I speak Irish, and so the Gaelic names or the Irish names for plants are often fascinating. You can hook a whole other set of people by, by allowing that element to be part of, of how you communicate about plants and about nature. If we're dealing with farmers, and that's a huge part of my job, obviously, I have a, a, a responsibility for semi-natural grasslands and for working on, their, their, on elements to do with their science and conservation. So I deal with farmers all the time. Semi-natural grasslands need management, so we need farmers. Um, farmers will often want to know, if we're talking about grass identification, is, does that make good forage? Should they graze that early in spring? Will that form tussocks if I don't graze it till, uh, till, till winter time? Whatever it might be, management questions and elements will be part of the information typically that, that, that grabs farmers. Um, so I think overall, we also have to think about tailoring our message. Um, we need to tailor our approach and maybe our starting point as well when we're communicating. And by doing that, you can potentially reach an awful lot more people and capture their interest. And just in terms of some examples, uh, just to hop back, I'll put my previous hat on. Um, when I was working as the, the Ireland officer in the BSBI, a great amount of change has happened over the last 10 years in the BSBI in Ireland. It really has changed dramatically. And one of the, the pivotal things was the creation of the Ireland Officer Post. It really was a catalyst. It provided a hub and a focus for communications. And the other thing that kind of coincided with that, with the creation of that post, uh, the, the, it, it didn't exist before that. We didn't have an Ireland officer. So, we, you know, it was a kind of, it was, a, it was and still is a small group, but it allowed it to expand. But the other thing that really was a game changer in Ireland was the fact that we embraced social media. And I can tell you, it wasn't the most strategic because we were all learning about social media. We were, it, it was new to us all. Uh, groups on Facebook didn't exist yet. So it was very scattergun, but what it was was open and genuine and enthusiastic. And it really changed the scene and it allowed us to open the organization up in particular to a whole set of young people, new, younger people that were more tech savvy. And Billy, our next speaker, is going to obviously touch on, on young people and the BSBI a bit more. 
But one of the things that, that I did as Ireland officer, I was aiming to create a bit of a scene, uh, a botanical scene on social media. And again, not massively strategic, um, but the idea was to try to create something that was open and energetic and a shared space for learning and also sharing experiences. Not everybody comes and wants to learn scientific names, but they do want to share experiences. And I think that's a, a very important thing. And the results have shown that there's been that there is quite a large proportion of younger people in the BSBI in Ireland, which is just fantastic. It really future proofs us and it gives, you know, it, it means we have a, a more inclusive um, group in that way. Some of the other things as well that I've learned along the way has been focused on how to how to deal with farmers. And I've I guess it's the same in the UK. It's certainly the case, certainly the case in Ireland. There's this perceived gulf between people that are interested in nature on the one side and farmers and land managers on the other side. In my personal experience, that gulf is 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 almost never there or it's much, much less in reality when you're dealing one to one. I have numerous anecdotes of going to meet farmers that maybe the neighbours warned me, oh, that man's very cross. No, they won't let you on. They won't, they won't be interested in what you're doing. And I've gone and met the person and spoke to them. And almost invariably, people are delighted to find somebody and speak to somebody that sees value in their land, sees value in how they've managed their land thus far. And again, I think the approach uh, of trying to find a common ground and trying to approach people with openness is always, always a good move. Um, and like I said, through my work, I do an awful lot of work with farmers, trying to support them, try to help them see if they don't already see or realize the, the value in the semi-natural grasslands that they might be farming that have existed and continue to exist because of how they farm. So look, to wrap up, some of the key things, I think my messages in terms of how, how uh, guidelines maybe for building, continuing to build a diverse community, approach everything with openness and bring your passion. Everyone at this meeting is passionate about plants and about nature. That's, that's a given. Bring that and that genuineness is enough to build, to, to bridge any gap. Meet people where they're at and then seek out the common ground. There are very few people that don't see a value in nature. They just may speak about it differently or come at it from a different angle, but it's there. And our passion and our ability to communicate can, can, uh, can uh, help to, to bridge this gap. And listen, it's, it's infectious if we speak with openness and with genuineness. OK, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Maria. And you gave a perfect segue into our last, the last of our, the last of our panelists, which is Billy. So, Billy, over to you. Uh, hello, I'm Billy Forward. Uh, I'm an 18 year old botanist from Cornwall. Uh, I've been interested in plants ever since I was little, uh, but it began to uh, grow when I began to cultivate carnivorous plants. Um, there are so many varied forms of carnivorous plants across the world. You know, you have the pitcher plants in the Americas. You have you know, hundreds of species of sundew in Australia. Um, but, you know, these, um, th this led me to uh, discover the native carnivorous plants that we have in our own country. Um, so we have the, uh, the, you know, the sundews that can find um, in sphagnum peat bogs, the butterworts that grow with them as well. And then you've got the bladderworts that sometimes grow alongside them in bog pools. And being in these environments led me to become more curious about the other plants that um, these carnivorous plants shared um, with. So I wasn't just interested in carnivorous plants anymore. I was interested in a whole variety of plants. And once I began to learn more about um, the plants that lived in these environments with carnivorous plants, um, I then began to branch out into other habitats. And so that's kind of how I began my botanical journey. But it hasn't necessarily been easy. Um, there have been a few difficulties. Um, as a young person, it's quite nerve wracking talking to much older, much more experienced people about botany. It's <laughs> even now my heart is beating. Um, you know, it is it is a nerve wracking thing to do. And, um, you know, I can remember the first email that I sent to my vice county recorder um, and I just hung around the computer just waiting for his response because I was just so anxious and eager to receive it. Thankfully, he did respond and he, re he responded very nicely. Um, and I think that response from him led me to, you know, it, it, it led me to believe that, you know, yes, they're old but they're nice. They, they want to talk to me about plants. 
they want to foster my passion for them. Um, so I've done a lot. I, I say I've done a lot. I've um, worked alongside the botanical uh, group in Cornwall. Um, I haven't done many um, outside um, meetings with them. Obviously, COVID got in the way of it massively. So a lot of my very recent botanical journey has been done independently. Um, so very recently, I just started going around my local area and seeing what plants grew where, in what abundance they grew, whether or not I could find anything rare. And, you know, I have found incredibly rare plants. I found um, moonwort, um, which was the first time that it had been seen in Cornwall for over 25 years up on Bobman Moor. And that was a complete coincidence that I found it. I was just walking in a place that my dog was pulling me in the direction of, had I not done that, wouldn't have found it. Um, but like I said, a lot of my botanical journey recently has been very independent. And I think I would find it perhaps easier if there were um, some sort of mentoring scheme, maybe, that the... Um, that the BSBI offered to younger members. So, you know, as we all have experienced over the um, over the COVID lockdowns, is that Zoom is a really, really good resource to use. You know, people from across the country can talk to one another um, with very little cost. You know, the only cost really is that you've got to have some sort of device that you can use Zoom on and also time. But obviously, you know, that's far easier than going to meet someone in person. Um, so my thoughts are that maybe if there was a mentoring scheme, it could mainly be done over Zoom. But then you could have maybe a few meetings in the summer when the weather is nicer and there's a far greater variety of plants flowering. And you could go out and you could meet your local recorders. And then those local recorders could then begin to teach you about plants in the local area which I think is such an important thing to do because if those people don't teach you what grows where why it grows there that knowledge is lost um but also this but you know the, this this mentoring um idea that I've been thinking of you know how would who, who would qualify for the mentoring you know would there be a prior amount of botanical knowledge required for the mentoring? Um, and how could people be fairly chosen for the mentoring? You know, we, the BSBI want to be um, fair to everyone and they don't want to discriminate against anyone. So how could you bring that fairness into it? You know, how could you perhaps encourage vice county recorders to sign up for a mentoring scheme if it were ever created would there be you know would they be paid for the time that they put in to the mentoring scheme and you know that's 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 all <laughs> that's brilliant billy and can i just tell you as a person who did not grow up in britain i'm fantastically intimidated by all these people who know all these british plants i mean i'm hopeless i'm quite good at the plants i study but I'm really rubbish at everything else. Yeah. So, so it's so it's so it's not age dependent. And I'm I'm a bit I'm I'm a bit intimidated about going on field meetings where everybody knows the name of everything, and I'm going, well, you know, it looks like a plant to me. But um, yeah, so there's a bunch of really interesting thoughts that came out of that, and 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 one of the things that I think, I mean, a couple of things came out of those four really different perspectives for me, and those are four of many many different kinds of perspectives about how to include everybody um, is, is the business about plants being everywhere. Mark said quite clearly, plants are everywhere. And we've all known that during lockdown and we weren't able to go anywhere, that we could still botanize out in the road, you know? And that's also a kind of access issue, isn't it? Because if you don't have a car and live in somewhere like central L London, um, it's really hard to get anywhere where it's proper countryside. You really are limited to a few places. The other thing I think that I, that I came out of that for me was about start where you start. 
is, is finding a bit of common ground. So I'd just like to ask um, all, of, all of the panelists, and, and, and I'll just kind of, you know, you, everybody can just chip in when you want to. But, but, you know, are there times when you couldn't find common ground? Has there been, has there been a situation where you felt, you know, I'm beating my head against a wall here, or has it always been easy? Mark, do you want to start with that? Because because you've had a lot of experience reaching out to people. Um, yes, it, it hasn't always been easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's been driven by an interest. So the 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 interest in what's out there, and yeah. why shouldn't I um, just find it, explore it, and often then you realize that there are allies, there are associations that can be made. Maybe when you're out and uh, um, uh, Billy mentioned it, I think, but when I'm walking with a dog, you know, there's fortuitous moments. Mm -hmm. And maybe somebody says, oh, that's such and such. And you think, oh, wow, that's really helpful. Um, But it's, it's, it's to have the resilience as well. And that resilience could be through an organization organization like the BSBI who are there in the background who can say well yeah we can we can offer that further support so that people don't just think oh I can't say that word because I don't know it and therefore they they kind of go back home or they, they don't put something online which they've found so I think that sense of trying to encourage people to keep keep going I always tell people that nobody knows how the Romans spoke Latin, so you can say it whatever way you want. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's interesting. So that kind of means that we're sort of hitting something that somebody's already interested in. Fal, you, would, you wanted to say something here. Yes, I do. <clears throat> I would like to say the ethnic minority people, which I am, we are really anthropogenic people. But when I came here in this country and I did not know where to go, I was working in a scientific world, but we had no, um, nothing about the BSPI or the um, RSPB or anything, didn't know anything because there was no advertise in the journals. So we walked and then when it's time to relaxation, we went out for a walk, but didn't know what are these plants and everything. Everything was totally unknown. Even didn't know what dandelion is. You know, saw the dandelion, but didn't know dandelion and daisy because nobody told me this is that and that is that. And I didn't know where to go. I was going out for walking, but had no knowledge what these plants are. I didn't know where to go. So that is one of the big barrier to advertise. You know, like Asian community, there are book fairs, there are um, temples and things, and also Asian language. A lot of people are language is a barrier. So to do the BSBI um, botany ideas in different language and to publicize, to say, we are here, you can come to us and we can help you to find plants and get to know what these are. So I think there's one of these big mm-hmm. issue about um, the, the, you know, the getting well, to know where to go. Isn't it? It's yeah. about visibility because you can be open, but if you're not visible, Nobody, yeah. nobody, That's, nobody. I mean, up. all the big journals, you'll never find the advertise for the BSPI. Well, or, I don't think they would let us in there, really. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it, it will be nice so that people can uh, look at it and know where to go to learn the plants. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. one of the big issues I faced. Yeah, so people are putting lots of messages in the chat. And I've got a couple, I've got a couple questions in there, but I'd like Maria to address that. And then maybe Billy a little bit about, you know, what, you know, where would you start? But Maria, go ahead, because you because you start in different places with different people, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And I suppose one thing I was conscious when I was thinking, oh, what will my my five minute message be? And I wanted to keep it positive. But I also thought sometimes it's important, it's important to be realistic. So your 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 start point for this is there always common ground. Look, the reality is often there isn't or it's so hard to find or you don't have the time or the mechanism to reach the common ground. There nearly always is something, but depending on how you're interacting with people, you might not have the space or the time to find common ground. Uh, One of the things that you just cannot beat is meeting people in person. And obviously we've had huge blockages to that because of COVID, not least over the last year or two, a conversation with somebody that there might be, there might not be much apparent common ground 
in the field, standing in a field, looking at a hedgerow, saying, isn't the robin beautiful? That kind of conversation becomes so much easier and the common ground becomes so much more apparent. So wherever possible, the field meetings, some of the things that the BSBI does so well and has tried to, we've, we've come up with very good substitution mechanisms like, like what we're doing now, having conferences online. Yeah. And actually they facilitate access in one way, people that might not travel, including people from Ireland typically don't tend to travel to the annual exhibition meeting or fewer, fewer of us do. Mm -hmm. And I bet there's a good few tuning in today. So that this is good, this facilitates access in one way, but really human interactions are absolutely fantastic and you can find common ground, particularly where the interactions might be more, where you're searching for the common ground harder, that face-to-face -face, uh, uh, interaction on site in the field is, is hugely important. So yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge common ground can be hard to find at times, but um, again, a diversity of approaches uh, is important, yeah. Well, what about you, what about you Billy? Because you, you mentioned the whole thing about, you know, not being able to meet people in person. So how, how do you feel about, but, but you also have the idea of having a mentoring scheme over Zoom, which I think is a really intriguing idea because, because I do, I have students, I have students all over the world and they're, they're in lots of different places. I mean, they're in Peru, they're in Argentina, you know, they're all over the place now. And um, we do all of our stuff by Zoom and yeah. it works. So with me, uh, the, the common ground issue, especially for me, is that, um, you know, I have friends and whenever we're out on a walk or something like that, I always go, look at this plant, isn't it interesting? And very often they will look at me with a blank stare as if I'd said something completely foreign to them. Um, and I, I, I think from um, uh, my successes in teaching my friends about plants has come from the, from the plants that they can eat, that they can smell. Um, so I'll be walking along and we might find some wild garlic and I'll go and I'll pick a leaf and I'll chew on it and I'll go, have a taste and by doing that you've, you've built the the, the the bridge in in their mind that this is a plant to be noticed it's not just something that um you know you can walk past or anything like that and so by having these small interactions with my friends you know i i, I hope that i've increased their level of plant knowledge even if it's only, by only a little bit yeah i'm pretty sure you every little bit helps doesn't it yeah yeah, that's that's a really interesting thing about about the the common ground and everything. And so, Mark, you've been doing a lot of actually reaching out into communities, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know, in a in a very active way. So, what things have worked for you reaching out into the community, particularly into the the, the community of, of of black people in in Sheffield? Mm -hmm. um, we've we've done it through. Um talking with some of the different community groups. So um, there were a group of um, elders within the Caribbean community who used to meet in the community centre, but obviously COVID affected that. But we then began to take them out. Um, uh, one session went horse riding. Another occasion, it was to go to um, a flower show, getting them talking about maybe their experiences of growing up in the Caribbean, then looking in their own gardens, looking in, in the community around them. Um, we've done work with some of the primary schools um, as a great way of getting young people to talk about what they see in their local area and with, with it, within the schools as well. And that can then be through setting up a club in school that is self-sustaining, perhaps working with one of the local teachers. Um, we've done some work with research as well, air and pollution research because that affects not just the local schools, but parents are interested because it affects their child. And you can often say, well, plants and flowers are indicators of what's going on kind of with the climate in this, in this local area. Yeah, that, those, are, those are some really good ways. Um, I was wondering, so Fal, I was wondering, do you, how much work is there internationally with visually impaired people and, and botany? Do you have any examples of things that are happening outside Britain that we could maybe learn? Well, because, because I'm from Bangladesh, so I was interested what's going on in my country mm -hmm. about the, the visually impaired people. And I found out that there's a, in the organization and Nazia Zabin, she's from Bangladesh Bail Foundation. 
and they believe that every human being has got the right to learn. So what they have done, they have published 92 Braille books for adults and children, mm -hmm. and they have been distributed free of charge. And they also have a special um, designated corner in the library for the visual impaired people to study the Braille books. So they have been doing a lot of um, uh, interactive work with the yeah, So visual. publishing in Braille is something that would be quite a good idea. Maybe we could think about, you know, Dinky Moira in Braille might be quite a fun thing. We need to find, yes. to find a yeah. Braille printer. But yeah, so, and, and so Maria, I was, I was really interested about, about the farmers as well, is, um, is I think actually one of the things you said really resonated with me is that once you, once you as a person from the outside tell some, the, someone that what they do has value, so again, it's kind of recognizing the value in someone else, is that a really good way to kind of break down those barriers and get started? Absolutely, absolutely. My, and uh, rather than a, you, you could also express value in them, but but actually their land and how they've managed their land. Yeah. So uh, as an example, the 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 NPWS, the organisation I work for, we have a, a farm plan scheme, and it's like an agri environment scheme, but it's quite tailored. It's quite bespoke. And there was a farmer that I visited his land last year, and. I'd never met him before. I didn't have any context. But the man I met at the start of the event, and at the talk, it wasn't an event, the, the walk, and the man at the end was quite a different man. He had become excited again. So his land is on a hill and he doesn't have easy access to it. It's quite hard to manage the stock and he's getting older and has some health issues. And he had never had anybody tell him that his land was special and he had never had anybody offer any support. And we were in a position to be able to say, look, we're going to have to, to work all this out and see how a farm scheme can work. And, you know, you love to fill some forms and we love to, to do a lot of work. It, it has happened, I can tell you. But we might be able to give you some support and some knowledge. And we said, this, this is an amazing hillside, but the quality is decreasing because it's not being grazed enough. And he was saying, well, look, I find it hard. And we said, well, maybe we can help you with that. The man, And we, we talked about maybe that he might get in traditional breeds, that we could help him put in a trackway. All of those things have actually happened. Now, sometimes life doesn't work out. Uh, you know, the, the, the hurdles can sometimes be quite large, but this has worked out. And we have a, a, a man and a whole family now that's reinvigorated into farming because of people coming and expressing an interest and expressing value in his land and in how it was and offering some solutions. Now, again, uh, that's an example of a success story. The solutions are sometimes hard fought. But I really, I've had a numerous times where people have said, now, maybe it's their perception, but they've said this is the first time somebody has said my land is valuable or that there are interesting things to see here. And I think that's very sad. And I think there is there's a huge job of work, BSBI and all sorts of people that work in, in this area in terms of helping landowners to understand that something they have has value. If it's a semi-natural habitat, if it hasn't already been used strongly for agriculture, even if it is an intensive agricultural setting that could be, you know, great hedgerows, interesting birds, who knows? But very often, um, very often the farmers, the landowners don't realise. And so, yes, expressing value, you, you can never, even if they've heard it many times, it's still useful and nice to hear. So we should never miss an opportunity to tell people that something is valuable, interesting and important. There have been, there, there can be a certain res, uh, uh, reluctance to do it in some quarters uh, because it has happened very rarely, but it has happened that a landowner worries about maybe a future uh, nature conservation designation or a future imposition of restrictions and that they've willfully then removed or damaged something. Again, in my experience, that has happened, but very rarely. You are much better off sharing the value of something and, and people tend to, to, um, to react to that positively rather than the opposite. So just because a few bad things have happened is, is not a reason to, to not share the, the value, I think. Well, we often hear the bad news, but never hear yeah. the many, many good news That's stories it, that, go, yeah. that go behind that sometimes. Um, Billy, I was wondering about, about your interest that started in botany, because I, I came from a non-botanical background. So I didn't go to, I, I wasn't going to do botany when I went to university. I was doing other things. Um, but you started in being interested in a particular group of plants. So do you think that like carnivorous plants, there are other groups of plants that are almost like... Um, this is going to sound really terrible, but sort of starter drugs for botany, you know, kind of, you know, those things that kind of grab people and just get them so interested. And would it be good to set up kind of networks of enthusiasts in particular groups like that? 
Uh, yeah, definitely, for sure. I mean, you know, you only have to look on Facebook or something like that for the group, for the big groups um, of plant enthusiasts, like that cacti, that's one of, that's a big group of plants that um, get people really excited. You've got orchids as well, because obviously the orchid family is massive. Um, wow. So there's, there's such, a, <laughs> su- such a big, like, wide array of a uh, wide array of angles that you can come at for the orchid family you can have house plants you can go outside you can look at them in your own country uh, there's carnivorous plants again you know they are absolutely fascinating i love carnivorous plants so much um i can't think of many other plant families but those those three are, are definitely yeah. definitely up there for the for the intrigue Yes. And the starter truck, like you said. <laughs> I always feel like that's kind of, you know, I, I mean, I can, I got into botany because we went, I had to take a science class and I wanted to take marine biology because I wanted to go to the beach, right? You know, and, um, and so, but I couldn't get in. So I had to go take this botany class. And, and basically we went out into the desert every weekend and just looked at plants. And I just thought, wow, this is great. I'm going to do this. This is brilliant. <laughs> Much more interesting than French. But Tom, there's another question that's come in from the from the from the audience, which I think I'm going to direct to you first, Billy. It's um, um Terence and Catherine say, my local natural history society is full of aging members, but we would love to welcome young people, but we, we aren't sure how to appeal to them. Do you have any suggestions for how how a local natural history society could really appeal to to people like you or or people of your generation? Um, I think social media is a really really important um way of getting the word out to um young people um schools as well going into a school and saying we are here we are a group of people that do this because some young people just don't have any idea that there are groups that do exactly what they want to do some young people don't think that what they want you know that that their interests can take them further in life Mm-hmm. so schools are a, a massively important way of doing it um yeah, school i think yeah. you're right schools are schools are really important so would you like target primary school children or sort of middle school or where would you target if you had if you had limited resources to do it you know i'm going to ask you the same question mark in a second <laughs> um i think I, if 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 it were a perfect world, you would say do it over the entire age group. That 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 would be the <laughs> the, the ideal answer. But I think maybe targeting um, maybe eleven to fourteen year olds. I, I think that's where interest really starts to peak because that's obviously when your brain starts to develop in quite um, you know it starts to develop in quite complicated ways. So I, I think targeting that age groups, you know, especially would be would be quite good. Right. So, Mark, kind of along those same lines is, you know, what what practical things could could BSBI do to reach out, you know, now moving away from local natural history societies, but thinking about us, you know, because we're thinking because we're very self-centered, of course. But um, but thinking about, you know, what what practical things could BSBI do to reach out to marginalized communities of all kinds? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd, I'd think definitely the idea of reaching out where, for example, where children are at. So primary schools would be a great opportunity. I'd be thinking about uh, maybe like community champions, whether it's um, an organisation or um, a person who is already active on the ground, who has the respect of the local community, who um, could act as a conduit between BSBI and the local community. Um and I love that notion of, um, you know, organising uh, this photographic competition that we've seen, where you get a sense of what's going on on the ground. Maybe replies come in and give a, an opportunity of knowing where the interest is. Um, and um, th- one of the things that we've done here is this notion of like organising like a residential. So you have maybe a group of the SBI um, experts who can come in can give off advice and support local community perhaps working with a community champion who mm-hmm. has access to bring people who can then find out more about um their interests or, or take further their interests and also as billy said that notion of engagement where could this lead to for some people they may be interested in some form of employment they may just want to see this as a form of a hobby or pastime um 
and certainly something which can then go back into the family to empower people to feel that they have a voice and their voice can um, influence the local area because they're able to speak up on things. Yeah, I think the back into families is a really important thing because I know that, that, um, that you know, I, I took kids in my neighborhood on little walks through the forest and then I came across them later when I was walking, telling their friends what plants were, which I thought was, you know, good. You know, the one plant I knew, you know, but I passed it on. So that was great. So fa- it, it's important sometimes. Uh, I always have a story of... Um, of a young mum, a couple of young mums, and I was out walking, and mm-hmm. one of the t- children said to her mum, well, what's that plant? And the mum happened to look up, and I could see on her look, on her face, a look of terror, that she wasn't able to tell her, I don't know, four-year-old or five-year-old, what the plant was. And um, one of the guys in our walking group happened to know, and he spoke to the mum in a way that wasn't condescending, to give her the tools to say to her daughter, oh, it's such and such. And that was really important. Mm-hmm. that she didn't lose that child at the age of three or four with them thinking, oh, mum doesn't know anything. So I think that that can also be important where parents maybe themselves are um, under strained or difficult circumstances. Yeah, I think I, that that's really important is that, and it's also that business about, about you know, just because because there's tons of things that each of us doesn't know. So that mum probably knew things that, that your friend didn't know you know and so so it's just recognizing that we all have huge lacunae in our, in our knowledge about almost everything but so, Mal I was going to ask you about um technology because you're talking about kind of printing things in braille and stuff and and that's one really good way which you've you've really advocated for to make things more accessible but are there other kinds of technologies that could be used to make to make botany more accessible to the visually impaired well, um, it's, it's more training really for the people to uh, show them how to use the smell, touch, these textures mm-hmm. to the, not only the visually impaired people, to the people who can't even, the other disability can't hear, but you can um, use the, the uh, smell and the touch to explain what tree it is. For example, the oak trees are very rough beech trees very smooth and they could distinguish between these. Um, conifer has got a distinctive um, signature smell. So they yeah. could, I found in my practical work, the, the, the visually impaired could identify this is conifer woodland and this is um, uh, not conifer mm-hmm. woodland, this is a broadleaf tree. Also the, um, uh, the elm leaves are so rough and the hazel are smooth, you know, all this texture thing to utilize, to show them. And once they, their memory is very sharp and their touch and the feel is very sharp. And they yes. would, the next time they recognize what they're touching and feeling. Mm-hmm. And also like, for example, in the pine, I used uh, um, two needle pine, three needle pine, five needle pine, and that really helps for them to uh, recognize next time when they walk. So repeat walk is very important. Also, this um, uh, talking about the young people here in Darlington, we have a, a sixth form college and we participate into that when they have an open forum. We go and with all our, our microscope, all the botany things, the mosses and everything so that we can hand on experience with the plants and identify these plants, what you see. So lots of games and things with the young people. Yeah. And also with the very young children, we encourage mother and parents to come with the children in the pond dipping. When they are dipping the ponds, we talk about the plants also. So, mm-hmm. you know, there is a, a very in, a nice way to start at the very beginning. Again, yes. it's that kind of, it's an intergenerational exchange. That's right. And it's, it's, it's very important for a field club like ours, which is 125 years old, to get interactive with all the community, all the young people, old people, the college people, everybody. And whatever we get, you know, that's quite encouraging. Yeah, great. Maria? I was going to say, tying a, a lot of this together, just a phrase that I haven't heard us say yet, but I think it's hugely important if you're thinking about how to effectively communicate or to spread a message in within groups, whatever the groups might be, that are not currently maybe well represented in the BSBI or the, or the Nature Loving Word. And I think peer-to-peer communication and peer-to-peer advocates there's no more powerful way for, for a message to spread than via peers. 
So a, a little bit of, of thinking and encouraging and just actively saying, you know, to, to somebody, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, Billy, but somebody like Billy, who has already come forward and is being a voice for younger people and speaking about what are the challenges or the, what are the things that make it feel intimidating, which is totally understandable, that Billy, you know, can be, could be a, an advocate for, for peer-to-peer sharing or, or likewise, you know, and it can apply in all sorts of groups. And I think in terms of, of farmers, it's hugely important as well. Farmers are so much more likely to listen to other farmers, local mm-hmm. farmers, people. Yeah. And that will apply in lots of different groups. It's just, you know, I'm here with that, that hat on today. So being able to encourage people to be champions within whatever uh, grouping they might be in is, is a really useful thing to actively cultivate. Well, so that's something really positive. So we only have we have like four minutes left. So I'm going to give you each one minute to tell us at the BSBI. So if you if you had. If you had your wish, what's the one thing you would have the BSBI do? Mark. Um, Keep reaching out to local communities and saying, we are here, we want to work with you. We don't have all the answers, but we are going to work on the journey together. And your ideas are important to us and you are important to us as people. That's uh, that's that's great. Fal, what would you do if it, if you had just your wish? Yes, my wish will be just um, to get the visually impaired people to learn more botany and mm-hmm. to um, also BSPA to come up with some help with the training and the Braille books with the Braille botany books. books. Yes, right. Thank Maria. You. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to say two things, but hopefully oh, I can be quick enough. <laughs> One is I think we, we've talked about going into schools. I think that's quite difficult to resource and to make happen. Perhaps we could go into universities where people have already self-selected into a natural science, not at the yeah. cost of schools, but yeah. maybe we can already do something like that. And the, the broad natural sciences. Yeah. The second thing then to do, to do with, um, you know, the farming world. What are the, there are small, relatively small subsets of media that farmers engage with. And I'm familiar with Ireland rather than Britain, but the, the, the Irish Farmers Journal is the weekly newspaper that everyone buys it. Can we have a presence? Can we have maybe a free calendar, a plant of the month's calendar that will go out at Christmas? You would have to think of reasons that people might look at your thing that you might put in, in such a thing. There's also curated, really useful curated Twitter accounts where a different farmer takes it on each week. Could we get a couple of botanist farmers? Uh, we need to... Um, we need to be more active in sectors that we feel um, are not represented. Great. And last but not least, Billy. Uh, to have the general public think that the study of plants is cool again, I think would be my... So the coolness, the coolness. <laughs> yeah. Well, they are so cool. We all they know are. they're just the coolest thing ever. I just want to thank everybody really a lot. And I think you've given us a lot of food for thought um, in the BSBI. And I think the idea of... You know, going back to what Mark said at the beginning about about thinking about reaching out and telling people that they have something to offer us as well as just the one-way communication out of, of us offering things to them, which would be which, which is is in my personal experience is really important because I know that everything I learn reveals to me how much I don't know. And I think that that's kind of why I'm a scientist and why science is exciting and why studying the natural world is exciting because it's so diverse and interesting. So I want to thank all of our speakers and panelists very, very much. And there's lots of questions which came up in the chat, which we haven't quite got to and lots of really good suggestions. So if we can please kind of capture those, you know, BSBI, that would be, that would be really, really great. So thanks a lot to all the panelists.